Welcome back, guys. Um, I want to now just revisit one thing that I mentioned in the past lecture. Um, sorry, let me click through these really quick. Hey, maybe this will help you review what we just went over. Um, but I want to revisit this angry tone. Um, Paul is just incensed that these agitators have come through and have advocated for circumcision and Jewish food laws. And one funny part of the angry tone comes to us in chapter five, where in 512, this is where Paul calls them agitators. And he says, as for those agitators, I wish that they would go the whole way and emasculate themselves. So basically Paul says, those people that want you guys to get circumcised, I wish they'd just go and cut the whole thing off. So see, Paul can be funny. He is an interesting character. Um, we mentioned before this question, this primary question that's running through Galatians of how are you made right with God? Paul is going to say that is through faith and that's it. There's nothing else that matters. You can't, can't add on anything else to that. And part of what is functioning behind the scenes for him is something that we're going to call an apocalyptic worldview. When you think of the word apocalypse, you probably think of the end of the world or that movie 2012 or something like that. That's basically what Paul has in mind here. For him, um, we are currently living, and for him at the time, he is currently living in a present evil age. And that present evil age was interrupted by the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that present evil age will finally be put to rest with the parousia or the second coming of Jesus. And so that is in essence what Jesus kind of, I don't know if I want to say that Jesus started off an apocalypse, but when Jesus returns, um, everything will be set to right. So let me go into this a little bit more. Here I've zoomed in on here you are, and you are currently living in the present evil age, and Paul is living in the present evil age. And you can hear that in Galatians, and you can even hear it in Thessalonians, but it comes across really well um, in Galatians because in verses 1, 3, Paul says, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age. And so he has functioning in the back of his mind that the time in which we currently live is evil and that within this evil time, there are forces at work. And these forces, there's another person, these forces are sin and death. And Paul is thinking of sin and death as cosmic forces that can entangle us and animate us in the present evil age. Sin and death are forces that have dominion over this period of time, and they are very, very bad, and they will get you. Usually, folks um, growing up in the church have been taught to think of sin in terms of individual bad things that we do, and that's not necessarily wrong. So perhaps if you use a curse word or get drunk or look at porn or cut somebody off in traffic, um, cheat on your taxes, cheat on a test, any of those things, those that is sinful behavior for Paul, definitely. But what he has in mind when he talks about sin is a capital letter sin when he talks about it as a force that, that is running around in the present evil age. He's thinking about a capital S sin. And that capital S sin is the force that runs the world, that runs capitalistic systems, that oppress people, that um, cause us to the big sin causes us to dehumanize others to such an extent that we could use them for our own gain. And so those individual bad things that you do, like kicking the dog, um, are merely symptoms of the larger power structure that is at play in our universe during this present evil age. And so what we really need is an antidote to sin and death these powers that run around in our present evil age. And wouldn't you know it, that the death, there's a cross for the death, the death and the resurrection, that's an empty tomb, of Jesus are the things 
that defeated sin and death completely. And so Jesus' death and resurrection had the power, I, I think it's mainly the resurrection. So Jesus succumbed to sin and death, and then through the resurrection, defeated them completely. And so Jesus' death and resurrection creates a new reality. And this, um, I don't know, this kind of arch way over the cross and the empty tomb is meant to represent a new reality. And you can see that it's separate from the present evil age. And it is a reality in which sin and death are completely defeated. But one of the interesting things about this reality is that it's an already, but not yet. And so what Jesus did through his death and resurrection did accomplish the defeat of sin and death within this new reality. But within the present evil age, sin and death are still running rampant and are still um, capturing people and systems and governments and whatever you might think of. Um, so. Already, Christ has defeated sin and death, but within the present evil age, we are not yet experiencing that full defeat of sin and death. However, um, here you are outside in the present evil age. The way that you can be transported into this new reality is through faith. Basically, faith or trust, it can be translated either way, your faith or trust in what Jesus has done through his death and resurrection is what brings you into this new reality in which those forces can no longer control you. And so this is a radical freedom. This is a radical new reality in which to live. And when you are a part of this new reality, you receive the Holy Spirit. And a lot of what Paul talks about in the book of Galatians, certainly he talks about faith and that that is the way by which you are made right with God, right? So you're, you were out of joint and now by faith you've been made right because you've been transported into this new reality. But the marker of being a part of this new reality is the Spirit of God. And we read this already, but I think it bears reading again. In chapter 3, Paul says, You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed to you as crucified. I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by observing the law or by believing what you heard? So basically, he said, he's saying, what transported you into this new reality? What made you mark? What allowed you to be marked off by the Spirit of God. And y'all, that was just faith. Faith is what marked you out as a part of this family. So, um, so stop trying to lay hold of other things. And it is by the Spirit and by your faith that you are now made righteous with God. You are dikaiosunate. Another thing that Paul is going to say is that once you are a part of this new reality, I want you, when you read through Galatians, to pay attention to the in Christ language. Um, Paul is going to say, once you are a part of this reality, you are in Christ, and Christ is in you. And so when Paul talks about his conversion in chapter 2, he says in 2.16, when God by God's grace, was pleased to, to reveal his son in me so that Christ was being formed in Paul. Um, a lot of your translations say to reveal his son to me. That is not what the Greek actually says. It says that, um, it says that the son was revealed in him. And so there's, there was this internal transformation of becoming in Christ or having Christ in you. And then Paul says again in chapter 4, verse 19, he says, My dear children, talking to the Galatians, for whom I am in the pains of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. So again, he's doing this kind of maternal imagery, this kind of womb imagery, and envisioning himself as the Galatians' mother who is gestating them 
and bringing them into this new reality of being in Christ. One other thing that he says is that um, if you have a, if you have been transformed into this new reality, been made right with God, been marked by God's Spirit, not circumcision, but God's Spirit is the thing that matters. Um, and if you have been found in Christ and Christ is being formed in you, you are in this new reality. And if you reach backwards, if you reach out of it, kind of think of the new reality as a bubble. If you reach out of it and try to lay hold of other things, that could be really detrimental to you. And so in um, chapter three, verses, verse nine, and maybe 10, um, he says, but now that you're known by God, and now that you know God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you are turning back to these miserable principles? And I think that a better way of putting that is um, elemental spirits. So, and I think this is the only place I do this, but I could be wrong. Oh, I should not do it this way. Anyway, in your notes, don't watch me write that, um, but in your notes, write the phrase elemental spirits. Elemental spirits are the things that exist out here in the present evil age, and circumcision and dietary laws are elemental spirits. They're things that exist outside of this realm of God putting everything to right, and so it's as if you're reaching backwards and trying to lay hold of something that, that is of no consequence at all. Um, Paul talks about the law as an elemental spirit, the Jewish law becoming more ethnically Jew, and Jewish rather, and he says that um, if you, oh, he says that the law was meant for a time as a pedagogue, um, and in the ancient world you read about this, that these pedagogues were people who would train up children so that they could maintain the family ethos, and so it was good for a time. Paul is being kind of positive about the law, but it's no longer needed now that you have the spirit. Um, in fact, one more thing about the spirit. Paul is going to go on to say in chapter, at the end of chapter five, um, a lot about living by the spirit. And what he's doing here is he's countering an argument that his opponents might make where they might say, Paul doesn't want you to obey the law. How are you going to know if you're doing the right thing or not? In fact, if you don't obey the law, then you could just run off and act however you please. And that is not appropriate. And Paul says, no, that's not it at all. He says, so I say live by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. And then he goes on to say that the sinful nature is in conflict with the things of the spirit. So if you are within this new reality, you don't need the law because what is guiding you and governing you is the spirit. And he goes on and he says, the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And against such things, there is no law. So if you have the spirit, then you no longer need the works of the law. All right, I think that's it for now. I will revisit this whole thing. I think in the next lecture, I get to the end of this. So look forward to that, okay?